Welcome everybody. We're going to open at seven. We're going to listen to our student speakers, and then we're going to. Well, you're welcome to join us. We're going to go across and listen to the All Shore Chorus uh, for for a moment, and then we will go into closed session. Oh, actually, yeah. I guess we're doing that at eight o'clock. All right. As the notice of this meeting was provided by setting such notice to the Asbury Park Press, the Middletown Hatch, and the Middletown Township Public School District's website, and the posting of such notice at the August T. Minor Administrative Offices and each elementary, middle, and secondary school of the district. Roll call. Mrs. Caminiti? Here. Mr. DeFranco? Here. Mr. Donald? Here. Mr. Taimo? Mr. Little? Here. Mrs. Minuis? Here. Mrs. Ray? Mrs. Stella? Here. Mrs. Rogers? Here. Now I'd like to call our student speakers up from High School South, Marina Liano. Good evening, everyone. My name is Marina Liano, and it's been a busy month at Middletown High School South. High School South and High School North students and faculty visited our middle schools last week to speak about to speak to eighth grade students about our Pathways Act academies. High school students had the opportunity to discuss their experiences in the academies that they are a part of. The second marking period will be coming to an end next week and students are currently preparing for quarterlies. Scheduling is underway. Juniors have chosen their classes for the 2020-2021 school year and we are currently working on classes for sophomores and freshmen. Middletown South senior Frank Mazza has been chosen as the recipient of Brookdale Community College's Caring Award. Anthony D'Antonio has been selected to participate in the New Jersey Region 2 Wind Ensemble. This is an audition honor, honor band. <coughs> Anthony was ranked as fifth overall French horn player out of the 12 selected with over 30 students from schools throughout Central New Jersey auditioning. We had four speakers from Project Pride, Department of Corrections at South with a wonderful assembly on the importance of making good choices and the consequences of not making good choices. The students were engaged and found the program very impactful. Dr. George had an open forum for students on January 9th, where students participated in a question and answer session. This is always a wonderful opportunity to have an open dialogue between the students and the administration. Middletown Friends of Diverse Learners had a film screening of Intelligent Lives shown at High School South on January 14th. The event was very well attended. Earlier this evening, there was a presentation by Mickey Francis to the community on vaping and social media held at High School South. Our Freshman for a Day program continues at High School South. Eighth grade students get a taste of high school life by shadowing a current Middletown South student through a portion of their day. It's a great way to get our middle school students excited about their upcoming academic transition. 11th grade English students recently took a gallery walk. After reading The Great Gatsby, students used textual evidence from the novel, along with internet sources, to design maps. Maps show specific details of Long Island and Manhattan, along with placement of the characters' houses. Using Fitzgerald's description, students interpreted placement of various locations. Maps were hung in the hall for all South students to enjoy. Keely Gablin's film, Snip, was screened throughout schools in Ireland as part of the Fresh Film Festival, You Judge It, competition. Her film was voted on by students from across the country, and she won first place for her film. Middletown High School South's HOPY winners have been chosen. Congratulations to Luke McCann and Tristan DiCrescendo. South's own Mr. Kozak will be published in, one, in the 100 Best Men's Monologue of 2021 for Lillian Whistles Back. Play practice for Middletown South Spring Musical, Mama Mia, is in full swing. The cast and crew has been working on this production every day after school. James Anderson was named the all-tournament team at the WOPM Holiday Classic for basketball. The boys' basketball team was named Shore Sports Network Team of the Week after beating three short conference top 10 opponents. CBA, Granny, and Marlboro from January 7th through January 13th. The CBA win was the first home win over CBA ever, and Granny is the returning TOC champ. This is the second year in a row the Eagles have been named the Shore Sports Network Team of the Week. Dan Mitchison, a 2019 graduate, was the recipient of a $500 scholarship from the WBO, WOBM Holiday Basketball Tournament and will be recognized at the finals of their holiday tournament. Finally, Freshman Vienna Eckerstrom set a new school record in the 100 bath backstroke with a time of 59.9 seconds. Thank you. Have a good night. Thank you.
Okay, so next we'll go to James Davis. Hi everyone, we've had a lot going on at work this month and uh, grade level expectations to go over for the rest of the year and setting goals for the students occurred between January 2nd and the 7th between all grade levels. The wrestling team is currently 10-1 and one and ranked number 5 in the short conference heading into their big matchup with South tomorrow in North Lower Gym at 6.30. The hockey team is now currently 5-7-2 and two on the season as they go to make their push for the state tournament. Acapella and Academy Corral visited middle schools yesterday to talk about the music programs and to perform for students. Freshmen were trained in CPR this month in the library in order to get their trainings. The boys track team placed fourth overall in the state competition last night at the state championship meet. The 4x800 team came in first place and the sprint medley team came in second place in which they broke the school record for their time. The girls track team came in seventh at this competition and they had two second place finishes, which resulted in two new school records as well. They were in the Charlotte Pearl Relay and the High Jump Medley, medley Relay. Civic leaders started their cell phone challenges this week. Students will be turning in their cell phones so that they will not be using them throughout the entire day. Civic leaders are also working on their passion projects, which are aimed to help the local community. The boys bowling team placed third in last weekend's Winter Wave Tournament, and on January 6th, Tony Trigg bowled a league high score of 290 against Middletown South. Yesterday, uh, North teachers began their participation in the Biggest Loser Challenge in which the first weigh-in occurred throughout the day in the main office. Dr. George held a student forum in the library yesterday or during lunch. Uh, the girls' swim team swam in their last home meet last night. The girls had a comeback win that came down to the final race in order to defeat Ocean Township. The girls' last meet of the season is next week, Wednesday, against RBC. And on January 9th, Natalie Hine broke two additional school records in 200 medley and 500 freestyle, which brings her to six total school records for the swim team. Students are currently enrolling in their courses for next year with the help of their guidance counselors. On January 14th, the mock trial defense team successfully won their case against Manasquan in the first round of the annual New Jersey State Bar Foundation annual mock trial competition. On January 15th, Arts Academy students had the opportunity to hear from their guest speaker, Rob Ahempora, a DJ from the Old 106.3, WHTG, and recently from the, Bob, from the Rob and Wendy Morning Show on 107.1 The Boss. Frank Dabari had the honor of being named for the All Shore Band. On January 7th, it was announced that Max Cusson's film, Voices, and Yasmin Yilmaz's film, Ideal Reality, will be screened at the Garden State Film Festival this March in Asbury Park. The boys swim team competed at the Monmouth County Championships on January 6th, in which Robert Hahn placed ninth overall in the 500 yard freestyle. Sarah Day Adichibis won North's Poetry Out Loud competition last week, and she will now be moving on to compete at the next level of the competition at Cat Wazy Theater. Sarah also received an honorable mention at the Sheridan Hotel for her Martin Luther King essay submission last week. On January 3rd, North juniors and seniors had the opportunity to hear from a panel of former North students who are now freshmen in college all across the country. And on January 2nd, 31 DECA students competed at the Central region, region competition at Kane University. James Davis came fifth in the sports and entertainment marketing event, while Amy Cardella and JT Meredith came in fifth in the marketing management, his team decision-making event. They will be advancing to compete at the state competition in Atlantic City on March 2nd. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, now I need a motion to go into executive session for student matters, personnel, and negotiations. So moved. Second. Excuse me, I'm, uh, Madam President, we also have litigation matters, uh, Deathbird versus Middletown Board of Ed, as well as KM uh, versus Middletown Board of Ed. So Second, of discussion? All in favor? Aye. Right. Opposed? Abstentions. To uh, move the meeting forward, uh, without any further ado, uh, I am uh, proud to introduce, to present her doctoral research study. Um, our teacher leader, Dr. Marla Beal, will be pre presenting on her research time in the Middletown school, school District on student-led conferences. I, am, I have to say that I am honored to represent staff 
that uh, where we've had administrators and teachers uh, who have graduated uh, uh, from some of the finest universities in the country, colleges and universities, uh, um, Rutgers and, um, and Monmouth University uh, and Rowan who have come and presented their work and their work is so integral to uh, the leadership um, and the progressive mindset in our district of a research-based institution. And that's really what we strive to be. And Dr. Beal, I'm very proud to introduce you. Uh, you know this work is very near and dear to my heart as it relates to student voice. And um, so, take it away. Thank you. Thank you. Hello. My voice is not as harmonious as um, the ultra report is. But um, thank you, Dr. George, for that lovely welcome. I did want to thank Dr. George, the board, the teacher involved in the study, the parents, the students for um, allowing me to conduct my action research in Middletown. Um, it means a lot to me. I myself am a product of Middletown schools. I went to that swamp school, which is where I am now teaching as an educational and technology specialist. This research is founded in the belief that education has to be about more than um, academic information, but also about the skills, the knowledge, the habits of mind that our students need to be successful in their life beyond school. Some of these skills include persistence, self-control, curiosity, conscientiousness, grit, and self-confidence. In addition um, to that list of skills is metacognition, um, an awareness of our own understanding, our own cognition, which leads to stronger learning transfer, deeper learning, academic improvement, and personal success. The question is then, how can we, how can educators and teachers teach all of those skills that students need to know in an authentic manner where it is continuously integrated into the curriculum. This study focused on using the framework of a student-led conference to focus on those skills. Student-led conferences are an authentic way of teaching students how to become self-reflective, self-evaluative learners, and communicate that learning to others truly bringing them in as partners in their learning. There are many different components of student-led conferences, and my study focused on goal setting and self-monitoring, portfolio creation and maintenance, as well as reflection. The purpose of this study was to examine the effect of student-led conferences on the metacognitive skills of elementary school students to see if there were changes that occurred over time. The research questions focused on the perceptions from the students, the teacher involved, as well as the parents. The study design began with a pre-survey to gather some baseline data about those perceptions, and then the intervention of student-led conferences occurred. The preparation for the conferences took several months, um, followed up by a post-survey immediately after the student-led conference, and then a follow-up survey was conducted six months from the start of the study. Um, data was collected from each participant group, from the students, the parents, as well as from the teacher. Uh, the two-tailed pair sample t-test was used um, for numerical data and um, grounded theory was used for to examine the qualitative data from the open-ended responses from the teacher and the parents. Parents, excuse me. Different themes were highlighted within the survey, and those, those themes include independence and learning, perseverance, self-advocacy, and curiosity for learning. Results and conclusions. Um, it is important to note that this was a small study. It involved um, one classroom in our very large district in just one grade level. So the, there's definitely a need for further research to see if the results can be replicated or if more data and further understanding um, could, be, could be learned. 
the students and the teacher did not perceive changes in their metacognitive skills throughout the survey. However, the parents of the students did perceive that their student, that their child had metacognitive skills. So it definitely indicates that more research is needed within this area. Looking at the student data, within the four themes that were measured, almost in three out of four of the themes, the data increased from the pre-survey to the post-survey, but for all of the themes on the follow-up survey, the data dropped. And so that leads me to think that we need to place more emphasis on the long-term impact of what we are teaching students and how that affects them, not just today, but in the days to come. The teacher response also contained for most of the themes measured positive or consistent results. Uh, there was only one teacher involved in the study, so it would definitely be wise to conduct the study with a larger population to gain further insights from other teachers as well. And the parent data for most of the measured, the measured themes was positive about the perceptions of their child's metacognitive skills after participation in the student-led conference. The teacher and parent both had opportunities to share their opinions through um, an open-ended survey, open-ended response, and the themes that were identified by both parents and the both parents and the teacher involved um, student involvement in learning, student pride and confidence, as well as student discomfort. And this was because the teacher and parents were being were wanting to make sure that their child would feel comfortable doing something new because student-led conferences although they've been around for a long time are new here in Middletown so just making sure that the children were comfortable with this new practice moving forward the power of the teacher comes not from the information shared but from the opportunities created for students to learn how to learn, solve problems, and apply learning in meaningful ways. Here in Middletown, we truly try to incorporate students as partners in their learning through our personalized learning initiative, through SPARK, through all of these other things that we do on a day-to-day -day basis. And those things are so critical as they help students develop skills not only of academic content, but also of lifelong learning, problem solving, and application in meaningful ways. Student-led conferences and their impact on metacognition should continue to be researched both within our district and the field of education. As, stu as student-led conferences have the potential to bridge the gap between traditional academic competencies and the enduring metacognitive skills students will rely on throughout their lives. Thank you. I can't emphasize enough how important it is for us uh, as an administrative team or as a district to have teacher leaders like Dr. Field who are willing to stand with administration for students uh, presenting and working on a cutting edge research so that we really can provide the very best education possible for our students. So thank you, Dr. Thank Dr. you. For sharing thank you. We appreciate it. Thanks. All right. Okay, please stand for the Pledge of Allegiance and a moment of silence for William Pankinia, custodian at Harmony Elementary School, passed away on January 15, 2020. Mr. Pankinia has worked in the district since August of 2008. Our prayers are with his family and Middletown community. 
I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you. 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 Thank you.
was able to try to penetrate our network and then provide us a report and allow us to uh, give us information on what uh, vulnerabilities you may have and how to deal with them. Do we have, how is the around the clock monitoring and working on that? We have a number of, of, of devices are in place. For instance, our firewall um, is obviously running 24,000 monitors. Um, it has alert systems on it. So if there's an event, it alerts myself and our another network manager, John, as well as our network manager, the text message. Um, we also have this called Omni Center Monitor, which monitors all of our critical systems, including switching and servers. That's actually off site. So in the event that something happened and we lost connection, that would additionally text us with alerts. Thank you. Thank you. Moving on to student services, Michelle Tiedemann. Good evening, everyone. We had a preschool open house on January 15th that was held at the New College School. We welcomed uh, any of the parents who will be new to our school community as they prepare to have their children start preschool in September. That's what you mean. Can I can't hear you. Oh, I'm sorry. Yeah. No, I think it's on oh, my mic. Oh, okay. Yeah. We, so we couldn't hear the last person either. either. Oh, oh, okay. It's not just you. We couldn't hear them. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. So on January 15th, we had our preschool open house presentation at New Mom School, where we had many parents come, and of course, some of them will be there first uh, joining of the school community when their little ones start preschool in September. So that went very well. The night before, on January 14th, the Middletown uh, Township Friends of Diverse Learners hosted a screening of the Dan Habib film, Intelligent Lives, which followed three young adults with intellectual disabilities. And it was really uh, a great film. There was a really good turnout for it. If you haven't seen it and you have an opportunity, I would really encourage you to do so. We even had a graduate of Middletown Township, who is now in a college program for students with intellectual abilities, came in and spoke, and it was really great. We have a few voting agenda items. There are some students receiving home instruction, some continuing new out-of-district placements, and a settlement agreement that you will vote on this evening. Anybody have any questions? Dr. Tideman, I just want to thank you very much for being responsive to the crowd at the, at the movie. You know, they, they, had, they all had some questions. They came from various places in the world. And you, know, you, you were able to get up, answer their questions. And we were feeling that, that the district supports this group and supports moving on and trying to figure out how to create more inclusion. I think it was my pleasure, really. It was wonderful to see such a great turnout. We, we really did have uh, quite a number of people that came out for it. Thank you. Thank you. Moving on to curriculum and instruction, Robin and Kim Pickens. Hey, Mrs. Caruso is going to give us a quick update on PSR, PSA, PSAT 8. I believe in the past I've already mentioned that we would be giving the PSAT 8 this year to our eighth graders for the first time and the rationale, and we explained this to Pick also recently, as far as our rationale behind it. Just to update you, there are 277 eighth graders, which is 36% of the eighth grade has voluntarily, you know, decided that they're going to take the assessments. That's a very high number for a voluntary Saturday assessment. So on March 7th, the Saturday, and on March 14th, another Saturday, we will be giving the test first at Thorne and then at Thompson to the students. And um, we're excited about it, and we'll share the results you know, when we get it to see how our students are doing. It's a pilot this year. This is the first time we're doing it to see if it is beneficial for all of our students. Um, this paper and pencil version is supposed to digitals because that's what we use when we take the PSATs and the SATs. We want to use the same sort of format. And I think that's all. If there's any questions, if you're curious, it's two hours and 25 minutes long that morning. Thank you. Um, as we approach uh, the time of year where we're going to be discussing the uh, not only the 2021 budget, but also potentially, you know, long-term solvency and, and um, future budgets and, and impact of uh, state initiatives, mandates, um, legislation, legislation. 
Um, we thought it was appropriate, and in closed session, there were items on the table. Let me know if you did not have a chance to pick them up. I can be sure you get them. Um, we did provide all staff members. It's also posted to the portal as of this evening. Um, guidance that we received last week from the New Jersey Department of Education regarding um, new curriculum frameworks and New Jersey student learning standards that are being proposed, uh, which will begin implementation uh, starting in the 21-22 school year. Um, you can see from the proposed implementation guidelines from the state of New Jersey, um, uh, there's a host of, of new curricular um, initiatives. That's this sheet. Does anybody need it? Oh yeah, I need one. Okay, so it's the current Thank you. curriculum implementation okay. schedule. The top image, the chart, is directly from the New Jersey Department of Education. These are the proposed implementation timelines. Uh, what the state is doing is they um, have presented these new proposed curriculum frameworks and student learning standards and implementation timelines to the Board of Ed. They did that uh, at the beginning of this month. Uh, they're going to be having open public hearings on these proposals um, in February and March. And it is expected that by the end of this year in June, the New Jersey Department of Education, uh, the board, the state board, will vote to um, adopt these, these initiatives and, and these schedules. So how does that impact us? We've already had to go back and revise our district uh, curriculum adoption schedule based on these new proposed timelines. And that's the documents that you'll see behind that, direct, that chart. Um, that is our current district, like state of the curriculum. You had to revise yours? We had to, no, we had to make revisions to the curricular areas that will be impacted by these proposed new schedules. So that is specifically science, visual and performing arts, world language, 21st century life and careers, comprehensive health and physical education, social studies and technology. So those are the areas that on the front chart we have been advised uh, will have, have great potential to be impacted by these proposed changes. Um, some of these are new, quite honestly. We currently don't have technology standards, for example, especially at the elementary level. Um, and we welcome that, honestly. You know, through our um, community survey, during our strategic planning, we've heard from our community members. We've heard oftentimes in the past in our PIC forums. We've heard at Board of Education meetings. We, we as administrators support, um, and we would like further guidance from the state in terms of curriculum standards for technology uh, instruction, especially computer science, coding, um, typing. We've heard that come up a lot. Um, and, and where is it most appropriate to uh, insert these types of skills and instruction to develop these types of skills um, in the K-12 continuum of learning? So um, this, the good news is that with this new document that came out last week, uh, we were able to defer some adoptions that would have been uh, up because of our own district timelines. Um, for example, social studies would have been up for readoption, rewrite uh, because of our our district's calendar. But we think it's prudent that the district take a pause, wait until the end of this year, use next year once the new curriculum standards are uh, released by the state to then rewrite our curriculum and look to do an, a, a possible adoption of resources the following year. It makes no sense to put um, to put a rush on the curriculum rewriting and adoption of resources ahead of the state issuing and putting out their standards um, because that would only put us, you know, in a position where we want to make sure that what we're writing is in alignment with what the new standards will be and any resources that are adopted are in alignment with what the state standards will be. Um, so we 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 really take this this seriously. Um, we meet, I meet with every single um, director, and in the past, Mrs. Caruso and Mrs. O'Hagan um, used to meet, and they would meet with me then afterwards um, to, to discuss the timelines for curriculum writing and, and adoption. We take it very seriously to try to pace that, um, to not place any overburden on any one year's budget, um, because as you know, certain adoptions, especially ones that are lengthy um, in, in terms of how many grades are served, like a mathematics elementary adoption, which we're in the midst of, of working out right now, which we need to adopt because our e-subscriptions uh, will be expiring at the end of this year, can um, be hundreds of thousands of dollars. And that, that's a large investment for a district. We also try to take into consideration that when you roll out too many new adoptions to any one teacher, 
That's a very difficult transition uh, for a teacher in a, in a given year to adopt multiple res new resources and implement multiple new curriculum. So we really do try to uh, piece this to not overtax teachers in any way so that um, we really get the best use of uh, the monies that we invest in, in these efforts. So there's also professional development involved usually when you do an adoption of, of new resources and curriculum as well. So we just wanted to put this out. So um, again, it's something that we look at multiple times a year, especially during budget development season. We talked to Amy's office about it, to um, the business office, Dr. George, just about those conversations, um, and the directors take that role very seriously and work collaboratively with one another. Sorry, Kevin. Um, so what is the pilot for elementary again? This year? Yeah. For mathematics. But is it, is that a name? Uh, there is usually a name for these things. Well, the resources come with a name from the publisher. So we're currently uh, piloting Envisions okay. and uh, Investigations. Those are the two programs or resources. And that replace Google Maps? That one of them, will one or potentially both, depending on what grade level you're looking at, potentially, would replace Google Maps as our, as our resource for teaching mathematics. Okay. Yes. Thank you. Yep. Any questions? When, when will that be implemented? Are you saying you're going to hold off till? No, mathematics has to be implemented. A new, uh, uh, a new curriculum and a new uh, resource needs to be implemented for this September. 2020, okay. Because our, our e-subscription with GoMath will expire in June, the end of June, the end of this school year. Okay. What we paid for for that subscription will expire at the end of this school year. So we're changing then, vendors then? The two, the, so in other words, we're saying the two publishers, yes, the two publishers that, that the committee chose to pilot were Envisions and um, Investigations. It was not going back. And as far as the other ones, we're holding off till when? We are, we are holding off um, the two main areas that were, that were on our original district ca uh, calendar were Health and Physical Education and Social Studies. So because of the deferment of the state issuance of those standards and those curriculum frameworks until September 2022, as you can see here, we're going to defer that. So next year they'll be um, looking at the release of those new standards, doing some curriculum writing, doing some um, uh, piloting, and then looking to implement in September 2022. And I, I just want to add, I really appreciate the board yeah. doing due diligence to ask the question as it relates to the curriculum and the timelines, the cycles. Because as pointed out uh, by Ms. Pincus, that um, you know, first of all, these are tremendous resources, most importantly, and are going to have a huge impact on student success. But secondly, there's a significant cost involved. So we have been working at continuously with the state to find out exactly what the timelines for health and physical education and the changes in social studies and technology, because they are also going to be significant financial uh, uh, drivers in future budgets if you see the timelines there on top of that i want to point out and you know I, I really encourage as many members of the public as possible to attend our budget presentations uh and our budget hearings are really important because there are other drivers that we're going to talk about that relate to curriculum and are also connected to uh, um, to facilities and I, I just want to point out health and physical education because it's it's on that adoption for next year there are also changes in drivers in physical education around 150 minutes that really have an impact on our facilities and our ability and the number of staff members we have and the and, and the ability to uh, implement that those state mandates uh, and, and 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 the additional cost and drivers that they're going to be in future budgets as well. So please uh, attend those budget hearings. All of these things are going to be discussed. Our first one next week will be uh, an hour long. It's going to be an 80,000 foot. It's going to give us, uh, let everybody know, you know, what the hurdles are and, and what the drivers are in the budget and what the hurdles are. And then in, in the following uh, presentations after that, the budget hearing, and they're week after week so right we're talking about the 29th and then after that on february 5th that uh budget hearing we're going to really focus on uh, programs and curriculum and facilities and services so we're you know each one we'll get a little bit more in depth and we'll get a little further into the budget um but thank you board for your diligence on the questions as they relate to this because as you already know and i'm just pointing it out to the public these are significant financial drivers in our budget just a, a quick question. Um, 
you know, I see some of these will, will you know, affect uh, efficiency testing, you know, AP tests, but some of these may not appear there. So in light of the state reducing our funds, what is, what is the uh, consequence, for example, if for technology, for example, that we say, well, you know what, 2022 my net worth for us, budget terrible, we have a budget, we have to 2023. So my point being, certain, certain of these categories will be on various DPs or whatever, you want to keep our kids up to date. Some of these are, so my point is, what, if we're taking right. our money, general education funds, what is the other stick that they have? So great question. I don't so mean that. What was brought out by the county superintendent or county superintendent round tables, uh, you know, uh, last week, um, is that to make sure that we're complying with these? Because as we move through the QSAC process and we're at QSAC district next year, these are the things they're going to be looking at. They're going to be looking at that curriculum. They're going to be looking at that implementation, um, and we're going to be judged as a school district on that and our ability to do that. And that could, in turn, then you know. And our ratings affect uh, further affect our state aid. So, you know, I mean, that they like they're accelerate it. In other words, take all the quicker. I mean, right? I don't know. So I'm just asking. In other words, I don't, don't want to speak to specifics, right, Mr. Tell, because I can't say for sure what you know what I'm just sanctions they because... would take. But they made it clear that the expectation is, as you go through the QSAC, uh, that you will, may not receive credit if you are, or that you will not receive credit, if you're not implementing those uh, state standards. And the question's a great one because- I was asking because when we get to the budget, you have all these different items. I, I fully understand what you're saying. Because sometimes you wonder, you know, it's gonna come down to priorities, right? In other words, you know, when we come to different things and you can't fit it all in, the answer's gonna be, okay, well, what is it? Is it like a, you know, some, a check mark against this? Or this? So that's a lot of just thinking about talking about this. You know, you wanna do it all. But there's going to be some potential some realities at some point. Well, we are obligated to implement the New Jersey Student Learning Standards because we accept state funds, what, regardless of the amount of them. Right. So we don't. That that's not an option. Um, so and and that is what Dr. George is referring to. If you don't, then you do not pass your QSAC. There are there are possible sanctions and consequences that can be placed on the district for that. In addition to that, every year when the district submits the budget, the proposed budget. Um, Amy and I have to sit down and we have to fit, they act when it's screened by the county and can support the state representatives. They actually will, we have to explain how we've earmarked specified amounts of money towards specifically curriculum development, curriculum implementation, and professional development for all staff. So they want to see that certain percentage of the budget is dedicated to what is the main priority of the district, which is educating students. Good point. And just last week, Mrs. Gallagher and I, we're at the county office with the county superintendent um, for a two to about a two hour review of exactly that and that's where the questions were and how they were they were driven. I think actually you might even have a conversation about that. Yeah, I know it's, it's, it's the final question I had, so I'm just asking you. Know, I get it. Yeah, you know, just, yeah. Not that thank you. Do it. I, I, I appreciate the, do, do, the due diligence because it further uh, creates uh, an understanding for the public as well. So thank you. And we're talking about this is our top priority, and we're talking about per class, per district. It's something like $900,000 for curriculum, would you say? Kim, I remember you presenting to us once um, for to buy, to buy a new curriculum. I think you're referencing the, um, the projected, uh, the first round projection of what a possible mathematics K-5 right. mathematics. I mean, that's not per class. That, 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 that would be like a K-5 yeah. adoption. So that would be our all 12 elementary schools, K-5, every K-5 classroom. You know, early projections uh, were somewhere around 900,000, but of course we're negotiating that. Yeah, so, so no, I would appreciate that. that. Um, Mrs. Gallagher, from a percentage standpoint, that would be a little less than half, maybe 40% of uh, upper one percentage point on a budget that can only go up by two percentage point without cap exemptions, correct? Uh, without having those in front of me, I'll put them up for the numbers. Yeah, it sounds about right. Yeah. Somewhere around 2.2, yeah. maybe 2.4, not being exact, but just, you know, trying to give people an idea, just a general idea yeah. of where we are in percentage. So. Okay. okay. Thank you, Thank you. Okay, facilities and finances. Looking at me. Um, all right. Uh, I, um, <laughs> I can say <laughs> we had a right. We had a, uh, a meeting on January the finance facilities committee meeting at uh, Fort Monmouth School. 
Um, we had a tour of the building. We looked at open, <coughs> open spaces there, the hallway condition. Um, we looked at the HVAC units that are similar to all of the elementary schools. <coughs> one, of, one of the topics that's come up is like all, a lot of them are put at the same time and they're coming due, if you will. Uh, you know, the facilities, finance committee, we kind of just meet in different folks to get an idea of the, of the facilities. It's nice like to see them every once in a while. Um, we had a long range facilities plan update. Um, Ms. Doherty uh, reported that the district is working with Spiesel to update um, all of the building floor plans with, with reflect the current uses. Um, as you know, we have to go through that process with the philosophy for the state. Um, we also talked about the concept of security vestibules. You know, they, they had two doors um, on different schools. We'd like Spiesel to take a look at that. Um, we also thought that Spiesel might want to look at the fields at Thorn. I know that comes up in shared services a lot, but maybe take a look and say, okay, is this really realistically can't nothing can happen here in terms of turf fields or whatnot um when we uh, draft the building budgets are uh, completed by school <coughs> the committee will review that and bring it back to the board um, I, I don't know the last time we did the the long range report for the state it's, it's old now right so it's a long time to get it uploaded right well we haven't actually done an official update because the website hasn't been right. accepting those since really the last time it was approved was 2009 so we did a budget update, which the board reviewed around, two, I think it was 2016. Yeah, so, the numbers were kind of, right? Well, so, there was different things in there. Yeah. We've done a lot of those projects. Right. You know, so we do That's a tier one, tier we're two, doing, tier three. Right, we're doing a complete update of the whole document, not just the project budgets for each building, but also capacities and, and other things that go into the complete document. So this is going to be a full blown update. Right. Um, the, uh, we talked about the school security grant allocations, the Alyssa's Law of Compliance. Um, but it's not an allocation related to uh, securing our children's future security grant is $538,000. Uh, preliminary guidelines have been released regarding application and eligible use of those funds. The districts have to have to be um, compliant with Alyssa's Law, though, um, which means that um, the, the law calls for the installation of morning lights and a panic alarm in all of New Jersey schools to provide the fastest possible support during code red. We have all of those. So the fact, in other words, when you get this grant money, you have to make sure you have that in place before you can spend it on anything else. The other item is too, you can also retro, retroactively apply this, these funds to things that you've already paid for. In other words, you can kind of utilize that budget. I don't know, did, I, did I state that correctly? In other words, you get the money, make sure you comply with Melissa's law, and then you can kind of spend it on other security. Yes. I think the retroactive part though may only be for this is all. Oh, only for the yeah. So the metal lights people see on the outside of the buildings that flash. Um, There's other parts of the system that we just purchased recently that achieve this, so we have to just get that certified through the state. Yeah, I think the committee mentioned that even if that was possible, we would want to do that. We always want to add more security, most likely, and we have to get more funds, we put more security in. Um, we, we reviewed um, a list of vacant uh, district properties, um, a, couple of, couple of, a couple in particular um, on Steamster and Kings Highway East, uh, Kings Highway and Sleepy Hollow, Kings Highway East that is. Um, we just took a look at them. This is, we had um, appraisals, I think were, were a few years old, I think uh, 2016, um, something we look at or we call like vacant properties, we have a few here and there. Some of the properties listed on the report are actually some of our school fields, so I don't think we plan on. Uh, selling those. Um, the, the health insurance uh, broker proposals, um, we, we received uh, six. The, the, um, the board was asked for feedback on uh, brokers they wanted to interview. The board conducted that. Um, what was that? Um, was that the 15th? Uh, yes, last Wednesday. Yeah, last Wednesday. Um, and we're still talking about the different impacts. We're going to talk probably more about that in the budget meeting next week. Um, there's a before and after care RFP out there. Um, the thought's going to be that the board will have a, will have a committee that will look at those uh, applications. Um, as you saw, there is a uh, resolution for the bond refunding tonight on the voting agenda. Um, this is about uh, the reduction of rates. We have two. We have, we have outstanding bonds for 2010. Um, they're eligible for refunding uh, this August. Seems to make sense. The resolutions in the, in the voting um, agenda. Um, we. We did a, we, I think we talked about the mid-year budget review. Um, we talked about the 20, uh, 2020, 2021 budget projection and five-year budget projections. Um, you we talked about that you, you know, reviewed the county, you, Dr. George, met with the county super, uh, superintendent, 
we'll talk about the mid year budget review. This is the current year budget, right? To make like we're all in line, we're all in place. Yes. Uh, we talked about next year's budget, probably right now. The ask versus our budget is about $4 million difference. We'll be talking about that next week at our, at our budget meeting, uh, which is open to the public. And we also talked about uh, trying to maintain this five year projection. So when we have these budget meetings, we talk about things that we might push, push along, then it kind of disappears. And then next year comes up again, sort of building on a five year projection of looking when we kick the can and we have to move things for the annual budget, what does that look like in the, in the, in the upcoming years? Try to maintain that. It's obviously, um, you know, it's, it's, it's an estimate and it's something that we put through some of the strategic planning uh, documents. Um, free school tuition. The committee discussed the uh, current tuition and, uh, and a proposal to raise the tuition for next year. Uh, the current rate is $300 a month, um, which the committee felt was very competitive. So the rate will be raised at $325 a month, um, which we also think is still uh, very competitive compared to what other you know, private organizations charge. Um, and just as a reminder, um, not everyone you have to go to a lottery um, in Middletown um, to award the preschool program spot. So not everyone is guaranteed a spot in preschool. Um, and then uh, we talked a little bit about revenue generated by a, a Board of Education fields. Um, I think it's like the township collects those fees. Uh, like 2018, 2019, maybe like $25,000, $26,000, $27,000. Um, and um, I think that's a question that keeps coming up. And we were talking about uh, what they do with those fees. And I'm not, I'm not really sure how much goes back into our fields. I think they, you know, I know that that's they're investing a lot yeah, into the fields. Was that the, the township? Yeah, the, yeah, the maintenance of the fields. That, that's what they say. Yeah, yeah. But, but a lot of improvements too. Well, and they yeah. reference the fields that have been sold to our use, mm -hmm. such as yeah. the Red Swan Field, the Green Park right. Field. You know, those were really big projects, and we're giving some contribution for that, but the township finance the whole I think one of the questions will be you know, about the folks for outdoor fields go through the township to. We might call schedule it or book it. The fees go to the township, and I think we talk about that all the time. Those go to us. Right. Go to the, the, the school district. Right. Except the rentals on our own turf fields, the turf fields at Northfield. Oh, the high school fields. Right. The high school fields, those turf fields, the, that rental. Do we rent those a lot? Not a whole lot, but we do rent them. We, we do. Them. Um, I don't know the number off the top of my head. Mine's not working, but I had a question. Um, you had referenced Spiesel a bunch of times. I know that we had appointed, you had referenced Spiesel a bunch of times. I know that we had appointed NETA. So um, how does that work exactly? So we're using both? We or? actually appointed both firms mm -hmm. from the architects of the district and we had had discussions <coughs> on this particular long range facilities plan update that since they had already done the updated budget a few years ago and had been uh, the professionals involved with the really almost all of our projects over the past several years that they would have a good working knowledge of, of that going forward. So the decision was to use them for that particular project. But you know, we do we have these both architects. We just did a project across the whole the auditorium this summer that we use now. Okay. Just curious. Right. Thanks. Right and that's um, if I remember correctly I forget. Um, I don't I don't know if that was really a committee decision. I think it was just based yeah. on what you think what we think. Like well, that was, our capacity, right? that was our was our recommendation, recommendation, right? Right, and we I think we discussed it at a board meeting. Yeah, it wasn't a committee meeting. Yeah, so to answer your question, mm -hmm. it's, it's based on what the administration they feel like. Okay, I'm just curious. We could, we could change that in the future in terms of. Um, mm -hmm. I'm not sure we use that if it for smaller projects. Well, I mean, this project across the hall was you know seven hundred thousand dollars. Right, that was oh, the, the auditorium. Right, yeah, that was a big project. Right. Yeah. So you know, we look at each thing as it comes along. Unfortunately, I don't know how many big projects we're going to be doing in the near future without getting some funding for those. But mm -hmm. you know, we do look at we have two firms available for us to use. And, you know, for example, when we were looking at, a, you know, for budget purposes, one of the things we wanted to look at was replacing the windows in this building because they, they need it. And we went to both firms to just get budget estimates to make sure that they were comparable, you know, in the same. Now, we're not authorizing any work with anybody because we don't have the funds to do it, mm -hmm. but it was good information to have for us to plan going forward. So, okay, thanks. so we utilize both resources. Okay. I have two questions, Tom. I know we use a lottery system for preschool, but do you know if there is a wait list this year? If there were people waiting to get into the program? Oh, I mean, like how many people? Um, 
There are the only reason they would use the lottery is because there's a wait list. Right, so that's yes, a that's the that's wait list. Yeah. Okay, and the other one is um, fields and buildings. We rent our buildings out. Um, we have uh, levels of how we rent them. We haven't looked at that in a long time. Level. You know, um, I forgot what they call them now. Even I lost the word. But we we have a category. Classes of users. Class class users. Oh, you're talking about the people who rent. Yeah. Not, I think, not, not yeah. I think we really need to start looking at that again because with funding being short, we need to make sure that the rules are being followed. That they're supposed to have so many percentage of Middletown kids on those teams, then they don't have to pay. We need to be following up on all that because if they need to pay, we need the income. Right. We have we do follow up, and we have you know we actually had a discussion just even a, a month or so ago with the winter bookings <clears> being done, you know, looking to get rosters and things like that. We do you know we do get them from uh, we'll get them from every time, but we do get them a lot of time, and we do vet them as as best we can. But you know, to be you know, to be frank, we can't always verify everybody's address, and we can't always verify if they're giving us the right information. But we do we do request yeah, that. We have a good list. Good list. Yes, yeah, there's a list. We used to no, get no, a copy you, you of it every so often. So you're saying you want a copy? It changes all the time. No, I'm just you, Yeah, I think we should all get a copy of okay. it and start looking at it because going to different PTA meetings and stuff and different organizations. Parents are saying that the, some of those rosters are not Middletown kids, and they're not paying, and that's not fair. Okay. They want us to follow up on that, and I think at budget time, like money that we're short, we really need to start looking at that, whether they coach for us or they don't coach for us. If their rosters aren't up to par where they should be, then they're going to have to start paying This is for, for indoor, indoor, indoor. Yes, for our buildings. Right. So the gym. No, I'm just telling us what's going on. The bubbles. So, um, yeah, maybe we, should, maybe we have a list, maybe we can distribute the board to take a look and we'll figure out what the folks want to do how we how we can check well, we that can, we can address this whole topic yeah, the next yeah. 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 i can show you what's what's been requested and what we can cool. we spoke to at shared services we spoke about this with janet to let at one point we spoke well they asked us about the availability of gyms and so forth because they have groups that are always looking for more space you know so they wanted to know, you know what was everything booked were we you know and and we do you know they do try to be equitable about organizations asking for space and trying not to let any one organization have uh, more space than you know pro um, rather than others you know we, we try to make this fair as I think the question came up like that's a few months ago, maybe a little while ago, about policy use of some organizations. I think it's trickier than you think. I think there's other organizations you see what they are and what they do. Yeah, the um, township said they could help us though. Try to, you know, try try to figure it out. Try to get to the bottom of it, exactly who's using. Well, we know who's using. What their addresses are. And, well, yeah. You know, well, if, yeah, if, if we, we wanted to tell that, they said if we wanted to send a roster, they would, right. they would check the yeah. addresses. But each category has specific rules and regulations. For the classes of users, yeah. oh, there's the, yeah, then there's qualifications yeah. for who, who's tier or class one, class two, class three, and and, and what their payment would be. There is a perception out there that just because people coach for us and they hold these clinics and stuff, that they're they're not being uh, made to pay. Nobody's checking up. When in reality, you know, if I just say for example, you drive through Mass one and in Middletown and you see the advertisements for a club. Are they, you know, now you know that both those towns are going to that building for a club. How many are Middletown and how many aren't and should they be paying us for the use of that building? And, and I think that's a big concern because the parent, parents are dropping off their kids and they're seeing, hey, the majority of this group is not Middletown kids. You know, so if we're, you know, we, we're owed money for that, we should be collecting it because we don't have the money to just give away our buildings. Um, I just have a couple of other uh, things I want to add in addition to what we talked about for our uh, committee report. Uh, we are currently working on uh, minding up repairs for some HVAC issues in two buildings, Bayshore and Umamath, Provident and Umamath. Uh, the estimate is about fifteen thousand dollars to fix. Uh, you know, other units need to be fixed there, so that's not as big of an issue. Um, there is a, an issue with units or at Bayshore. Um, that's 
probably going to be more than $100,000. So this is something that we're vetting out. It may be something that we have to take out of our maintenance reserve to fix because we don't have that budget issue this year. But um, we will talk about it more at our next committee meeting. And if there's anything to award or con you know contract to award, then we would be very to for future board meeting. But just as a sort of a heads up, these are a couple of unexpected things that we're looking at that need to be addressed. Uh, we also have spent some time over the last month or so looking at some uh, different uh, student information system and uh, basically HR and payroll and accounting platforms. Uh, there's a company called Genesis that does all of these things. They've done student information systems for a long time. Um, they've more recently gotten into the fund account or fund county and payroll and HR areas, and we've been looking at their their platforms and, and the functionalities and so forth. And reason being, the, uh, the system has a lot of features that we would like to have. You know that, that the performance would um, be better in a lot of cases than what we already have, uh, and even more uh, importantly. Uh, could represent cost savings to the district, you know, in the long term. Um, you know, we've been looking at the uh, pricing versus what we're paying now for various things, um, not just the uh, main modules we have, but a lot of ancillary programs that we have that we use for different uh, areas. So again, we're just in the um, you know investigation stage on this, but we just wanted to bring it to the board's attention that you know it's something that we may. You know, look to move forward with because again not only uh, that increased functionality uh, for uh, us and for you know other users such as parents and students and so forth but also for the cost um, and the money that we save the district so are we using genesis already no no we don't school. we use power school did for we our use genesis before did we no, I not that I know. I mean, they've been in existence. It's very common. Like no, ago. but I feel like we used this. I not no. since I've been here. And no, then we went before we had SASE power, power, power school. SASE before we had power school. I don't. I don't know that this district ever used it. But I'm sure we always yeah, looked at it. Know. You know, if you were on those committees, I'm sure that was part of the proposals the that were looked at. And it's time. very commonly used. So my school district uses Genesis, and we have for years. And they have the portal, just like power school, but. Most recently, they rolled out the um, the payroll and the HR component. Right. So now all payroll is done through this portal. So for me, as an employee, I can click on, I can see how many sick days I've used. Mm -hmm. I can go, do you know what I mean? It does yes. a variety of things, right, all in one spot. And, mm -hmm. and, and Power School doesn't do that at all? No, okay, we so. actually, Power School is really just our student information systems. We use even a different platform for payroll, accounting, HR, we use Systems 3000. And, and those two don't speak to each other. Oh, well, we also use Frontline. And we use Frontline for absences and uh, you know, other evaluation. okay. evaluations. Do you have, so, would you have a, a sort of a list of the systems that would put their chances for replacement? Absolutely. Because yes. we have to see like that yes. on the list of yes. paper. We've done that analysis, so that would be something we would review. Okay. And Genesis also has something called Report Writer. I don't know if, if Power School has something similar, but you could generate, you know, really detailed reports about things like attendance and, you know, technology, how many tablets are being used, or um, anyway, it's just I find it really useful. So yeah, and a lot of districts do that use mm -hmm. it. So you know, and uh, again, we're looking at. Comparing what we we're paying now for all this functionality versus what we would pay in the long term with Genesis. I mean, there would be some upfront, of course, implementation cost, but you know, then you know, subsequent years would be significantly less than what we're paying now. So we're looking at it. You know, we'll keep you posted, but we just want to bring to the board's attention. Wait, and I also heard, and I don't know, we haven't implemented this yet, but I also heard that Genesis has some sort of lesson plan yes. program yes. in there yeah. where you could submit your lessons yes. straight to your administrator, mm -hmm. which I like because, and I heard that it's great that it has a drop down menu for all the standards where I'm always copying, you know, <laughs> copying and pasting. I don't know, I just, so we haven't done that part of it yet, but that's another feature that I heard Genesis They has, do so. have, that's an optional feature, so mm -hmm. I'm not sure. If that's probably why we don't have it, it's an extra. Right, right, but they do have it. 
And we were talking about the before and after care um, committee, right, to, re to do the rubric, to do the review of the um, proposals. Right, we still have to establish the, the, the composition of that committee so that we can fill the, we can fill the spots. So that's great, right. that's something we have, we have to talk about in you know, our team. So, but we're, we're anticipating that that committee would be active early February. I mean, the proposals are due back January 31st. It would give us a few days to digest them, analyze them, you know, and then we would be in committee. How we'll often does the committee meet? You know, the, there's no set parameters. I mean, the committee, you know, it'll depend upon how the committee wants to proceed, and we can come up with a, a you know, how we're going to proceed. And we, if we can take one you know, one day to review the proposals and decide if you want to talk to any of the companies in person or not. I mean, there is no requirements. You're actually not even, and I think I've said this before, you're not even required to have a committee, but this is what, you know, we can do. Okay. Do it yeah, I mean, I'd like four of us on there. I just um, wanted to explain to the board members what time of day, things like that, so that they could pick if they can actually yeah, attend. I think I, mean, I keep, I keep you know, yeah. we just have to decide who's going to be on the committee, like, you know, besides board members and okay. the people from the district and Cheryl, you know, have some principal representation and we were talking about parents. Is there a consultant involved in this? No. If you're putting a parent on it, would it be an elementary school parent? I, I, you know, we actually decide that I'm not, a, I'm not the one yeah, really and I mean, it would be elementary, elementary because they're the primary yeah, because of middle the school parents. parents because the truth is, the calendar committee, when we had the calendar committee, it was an adult as far as a high school parent set up. I think, really, even on the calendar committee, I think it should be an elementary school parent. Well, definitely for the before and after care because I said I you know for my first dance was I wasn't sure, but now, I mean, I think it's going to be on because that's who's using the I think we're going to have multiple extra if you want. Right. But it still should always be elementary. Yeah, I mean, I think they're mostly used to practice Because they're the ones that do very few. I mean, there's some middle school usage, but not a small percentage. I don't know how the rest of the board feels. My first instinct was to ask that it be equal parts members of the public, but including us as members of the public. You know, and then um, employees of the district. We like, can't be part of the public. Right, I know, but we, we can't. We are can't wait to pass. The public. We're not. That's it, my. Yeah, we don't work for the district. Well, how do you think we should compose it? What do you think? I think I'd rather see the parents. But how many? Like how many? Of, you know, how many uh, people who work for the district and how many members of the public? It could be That's the idea. Yeah. So, so truthfully, you can, my personal opinion is if you make it top heavy, you lose the parents right away. Yeah, that's what I'm wondering about. And, and how do you pick the parents? You know, are they handpicked? Do the principals pick them? Because, you know, if, if they're handpicked, are they picked because of a certain reason? It should be like some kind of a lottery, you know. Or should the parents come from the way the schools that use it most? Or it could be. It's only if they're. they're Maybe their PTA should nominate the, the parents that are going to come and not be campaign. To me, that makes a difference. Anybody yeah. else? Yeah. If you have anything else to contribute to the conversation, you can always email me. Thanks. Thank you. 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 Are we ready to move on to policy? Uh, you just have two items on your policy. One is a first reading, no action for a regulation change on scholarships and that's attached to the agenda. And there's a second reading, which would be an adoption on the high school graduation policy provision that was introduced last month. What are we changing on the top? Is there someone who, are you hearing the question? What are we changing on the, on the high school graduation policy? It's, um, <clears throat> it further uh, extends the discretion of the principals in both high schools to uh, reduce the number of required credits because the district has a higher threshold yes. expectation of the state and that is to accommodate the senior flex students. Right, right now, the principals have discretion for very specific reasons and this 
kind of capture senior flex within those um, reasons. Go ahead, Margie. We changed park and JSLA as well. Okay. Thank you. And we updated the language as well. <laughs> Moving on to student activities, please. Okay. Uh, yesterday, we held a kindergarten registration uh, parent information meeting at Middle uh, at New Monmouth. Um, it was a very informative and positive experience. There was about 250 parents present of the students of the class of 2032. We were told that's what we're going to be. Oh, <laughs> 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 um, we really do appreciate the work of Mrs. Wilson and Mrs. Responti, um, who organized it and were the main presenters, and also the other staff members and principals that presented and attended. It was really a very positive night for the parents. They got a lot of their questions answered. Um, it was a good night. Um, earlier this evening, we had a vaping and social media presentation at High School South for the community. This was put on by Nikki Francis of Wellspring Center for Prevention. She's done a couple of presentations for us, um, for the students, at night for parents. She also came to the, um, to the school safety meeting uh, to, uh, last, last year, it was last for, uh, spring. Um, she does a really informative uh, presentation on current trends, what to look for, um, that type of thing. And she really does a good job. Um, and if you want more information on vaping, we have an article in the upcoming, um, which Dr. George is going to talk about our upcoming newsletter. Um, you'll find out information about what we've done over the last five years, plus some statistics on um, how, you know, how well we're doing. Actually, over the last two years, we've really significantly reduced vaping in the schools uh, because of those efforts, so I encourage you to read that. Um, on our voting items, we just have a list of our uh, scholarship committees for High School North and High School South, and that's our voting agenda item. Right, any questions? Thank you. Um, Thank you. Okay, moving on to shared services, we postponed our January meeting to, to February, so the next time we'll be meeting is the second Monday of February. Um, but no, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. We have that meeting scheduled for this Monday, February 27th. Oh, we do? Okay, January 27th. That was, it was postponed from the earlier January date to January 27th. Okay, so January 27th, just ahead of it. 6.30, okay. Um, okay, um, I'll, I'll confirm that, but that's the last thing to be spoken. Okay. Okay, sounds good. Um, the, there is uh, just some, the deputy mayor wanted to remind the kids who are parking at Tyndall, um and normandy that as of february 1st they will be ticketed so um just a reminder <coughs> to anyone who's parking where they're not supposed to on uh, tyndall or normandy uh park not to park there as of february 1st they will be ticketed can we send a phone blast on that just we to did. remind we all parents yeah. i know we did Again. but now the date's approaching pretty quickly yes so they, to, to, to your point mr kirkpatrick I, did that as soon as we came back and is continuing to follow up with that. Uh, also, it was a topic uh, for our discussion at the student forum uh, to make sure that everyone was aware and um, that he, he was gonna continue to communicate. It was also his January PFA meeting, mm -hmm. which he already had, we're gonna yeah. it there. So I know he's diligent about doing that. We will follow up again, though, but I yes. Today. Yeah. We'll, we'll, we'll talk to you. Oh, sorry. It's, it's the answer on the ball key. Why not put it on the ball key? Just to make sure. I would hate to see any of the kids getting the ticket. Okay. I, it's I, being I, announced yeah, at school, too. He's using every avenue. It, it's yeah. a big concern for Mr. Patrick. Well, yeah, it's yeah. not just him. They're parking at Tyndall Park, too. Um, yeah. that, that's a concern, too. With yeah, Tyndall Park. Park. And you know what? Tindall then Tindall the Park. parents say they didn't hear or something. If you're telling the kids, the kids are not going to just get I, I, Just to make sure. Yeah. Right. No, none of us want a ticket to kids. Everyone wants them to just right. not park there anymore. Yeah, I agree. Yes, yes. Yeah. Yep. Yep. Um, last. We talked. Principals will continue to, but I we know they're being diligent about it. Great. Okay. So for strategic planning, our next forum, Forum 3B, is February 12th at High School South Cafeteria at 7 p.m. 
Um, board members, on the portal right now, there is um, a script for that and the mission statement. If you could just please review it, get back to me in a couple of days um, so that we can put it on the district site. The idea is for the public to see the script, um, to see the objectives that have come out of this whole process, and to see the questions that uh, we're going to be asking members of the public to ask when they come up to speak and to participate in this next step. And that's it. That's all yeah. I have for Shares Services. And we uh, thank you to the board for being diligent with the committee. We had the committee, we had two meetings, a lot of time for committee members as related to strategic planning, yes. mid school house strategies last week alone. So a lot of time has gone into this trip, the revision of the mission statement, and uh, all of that is available to you. So, yes. Yes, two meetings to organize our thoughts for 3B. Yes. So that was good. Good. All right, moving on to personnel. Oh, we did that already? Yeah. Right. Oh, yeah. Public okay, comment. public comment on agenda items only, please. All right, seeing nobody comes to the mic. We'll move on. Um, I need a motion to approve the minutes for executive session 12 18 19 through the reorganization meeting January 2nd, 2020. So, Second. <laughs> Discussion? All in favor? Aye. Opposed? Abstention? I'm going to skip the president's report because that's really all I wanted to say is please attend um, our February 12th meeting for our plan B, strategic plan. I need a motion to approve. One through four under the report of the business administrator board secretary. So moved. Second. Discussion? All in favor? Aye. Opposed? Abstentions. Under the report of the superintendent, I need a motion to approve one through five. One through four. Sorry. Right. Right. One through four. Yeah, that'll be my report. So moved. Second. Discussion? All in favor? Aye. Opposed? Opposed on number one. Abstentions. Yeah. Okay. Moving on. Okay, so uh, superintendent's update. Uh, first, I want to uh, let everyone know that we're going to be recognizing our teacher of the, of the year at the February 26th Board of Education meeting. That's a great night. Uh, so we, we hope a lot of people will be with us. I know the students like to come out to support their teachers. That's a great night. So something to look forward to at our next uh, regularly scheduled um, action meeting. Also, um, um, I want to say that today uh, our <coughs> magazine went out. Um, so right over here, Mr. Rattol is pulling that up right now. That's going to appear behind me. Um, on the screen in just a second. A couple things I want to say. I know that everyone in the room is probably aware of the weekly newsletter that comes out uh, through the efforts of Mr. Rotolo. Uh, he reviews this throughout the course of the week with myself and other administrators, building level district administrators, uh, supervisors, director, directors uh, provide evidence of the best practice going on across the district. That weekly newsletter really looks a lot like quarterly newsletters that go out in districts, I have to say. It's so comprehensive, Chris. We're so grateful uh, for your work. Um, and then the Mid-Year Magazine. Uh, this, this was a content that really came out of discussions with the board of finding a way to cut down on our strategic planning evidence sessions where multiple administrators come up and talk and our, our meetings obviously are very long as it is. And, and, but even more importantly than the length of the meeting was really getting the evidence out to the general public. So I, I'm gonna ask Chris to just take a second to explain how many people we, we, that actually get this because not only does it go out an email to about 11,000 people, but Chris will explain it goes out 
through social media and websites to a lot more. So Chris, if you want to add anything, please do. Yeah. Uh, so the way that we distribute. Why, why don't you come up here so they can hear you on the mic? Yeah. For people who aren't here but are watching remotely or watch the video. Yes. Yeah, so the, uh, the way that we distribute this, obviously, we have our network, uh, the school community, uh, email addresses, uh, parents, students, staff. Uh, Newsletters on Friday are about to a little more than 11,000 uh, email addresses. Um, and our, our open rate on that is, is very, very good um, compared to industry uh, standards, which we actually read about in our, in our magazine. Um, we also have other means of uh, distribution. We have our social media platforms, which have thousands of, of followers on each of them, uh, not hundreds to thousands, depending on which platform we're talking about. So, um, and everybody who shares, everybody who distributes uh, on their own uh, accounts, you know, they have their, their followers as well. So um, it gets around. Um, we also have uh, partnerships with the township. Tara um, Burson, who is their public information officer, uh, she also has a, a weekly newsletter that goes out on Fridays to other members of the community who may not uh, be in our distribution list, they may not have children in the school system, they may not be associated with us at all, uh, but sometimes we have a uh, message and we're able to partner with them. Uh, vice versa, we do the messaging out. So it's a nice uh, partnership with those who uh, work with uh, there to also distribute information. So we have various means of uh, getting our, our programs, our initiatives, uh, our partnerships uh, out to uh, the public. We're developing more and growing these audiences, and we can do more about that uh, in our Long Day Theater review magazine, which was a really uh, when you send this out, is this a link that you're sending out to people? This is a link, yes. This is this is different than the uh, Friday or so. Right, so it's a link. So we can use that link and send it out to other people. Oh, yeah. Is it okay? You know, we, oh, we, we would appreciate that. Yeah, Thank that you. Great. Thank you. So if you could flip through that, um, I'm going gonna, gonna, gonna to hit on. Wait, wait, we don't have print copy at all. We don't do anything with print with this. But it can be. It could be, yeah. Okay. Yes, could be great. Um, so uh, the things that we're really hitting on and uh, on the Mid-Year Review Magazine, it's really important to point out this is connected to our strategic plan. So this is digital evidence of us hitting uh, building level goals. It's a first mid-year. Yeah. First I think we did like 16 newsletters and then that 15, 16 newsletters somewhere around there. Um, yes. Yeah, I, I don't know. I think I'm at 16 at board updates. We might be at 14 with this, but this is something that Chris What's and I have been working. Do, beginning of the year, mid year, and end of the year, or is it just at, like how do you? Get, at the beginning of the year, we, we'll start with the newsletter, you know, and we'll do those weekly newsletters, then build up to a mid year, which is really focusing on the evidence to this point. On so let me give you an idea. Our community partnerships. There's 20 pages to this. I saw that. Um, to, um, community partnerships, community outreach efforts, where we are in strategic planning, where all that information is, uh, new methods for communication in the school community, student growth initiatives, student success, personalized learning efforts uh, with our staff, professional development, advancement of inclusion, uh, and social emotional learning initiatives that we're doing in the district. You know, and we really try. Um, Mr. Whitman is probably taking a little bit of a razzing from some of his uh, fellow building principals. He is our cover. Um, we were considering Brad Pitt and Jennifer Anderson, but we thought oh, David yeah. was a better fit for us. So he's 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 on the cover, and um, it's it, you know it's something that we're really proud of. And I, I have to say that I was really excited when the board. Uh, uh, supported the idea of, of bringing on an information officer because it's so important in a district our size, 42 square miles, 68,000 residents, almost 20,000 parents, and nearly 10,000 students to really get these initiatives out there, to really have the opportunity to celebrate student success and to really tell our story of where we are and where we're going as a district. And um, Chris, thank you for your work. You've done it incredible job. Very grateful to building level administrators, supervisors, district level administrators. Everybody's really embraced this 
and giving Chris a significant amount of content. And that's part of why um, that's part of why we've been able to take those weekly newsletters. They look more like quarterly newsletters, but I'd have to say, Chris comes with an incredible amount of experience in significant experience in print media and online media. Um, and we're constantly talking about what other uh, social media platforms that we have a significant number of residents that are connecting to and what's our strategy and how we can connect with them. Um, and uh, Chris and I meet every day, uh, sometimes multiple times a day, usually after the regular day. And Chris is always available and just grateful for your work and your efforts, Chris. Thank you very much. Yes, send it to you right now. Send yeah, it to no, no, uh, yeah. board members right now. If you don't. To my board I actually, oh, I want to say, I sent an email with the link to all board members today. Yeah, well, we'll, we'll I send saw it for the link on there. I yeah. saw the thing. Like, I opened it, but I don't see the actual yeah, link. Yeah, we're just on the distribution list. Yes, yes, yes. It's pretty sure. sharp. Yes. It looks great. Yes. I like that you kind of screw it. Add the board members to the list is what you're saying. Yes. Yeah, okay. Great. Thank great. you. Thank you. All right, that's all for me. Uh, Thank so, you. action on item 24 is already taken. Our report's done. Thank you. All right. Okay, so under number 13B, I need a motion to approve number one through three. So moved. Second. Discussion. There's an addendum. I don't know if there's anything else. Yeah, I think there's one of those two items above. Uh, student services and personality agenda. There's one item for student services on the agenda. Okay, so. 13. Okay, and number 13B on the agenda. So moved. So moved. I know. So moved. Second. All right. Discussion. All in favor? All right. All right. Opposed? Abstentions? All right. Okay, I need a motion to approve C1. So moved. Second. Discussion? So. Facilities, C1. No, I, we didn't touch on this when we were talking uh, uh, before, just to give a quick explanation. It's okay. a revision of the uh, waiver that we had on the agenda last month for a classroom at New Monmouth that uh, does not have a bathroom in the classroom, but we are uh, using it for um, a class that is required to have a bathroom in the classroom unless there's a, an alternate means to supervise. So we're just revising this. We have an original plan to do it, uh, but now we are going to be uh, using uh, our professionals to do the supervision back and forth to the bathroom. So we just are sending a revised one to the county. The county's already come out, looked at it, they looked at the room and say, um, approved our, you know, verbally approved our plan. We just are memorializing it. So it's just a revision of last month. Okay. All in favor? Aye. Right. Opposed? Abstentions. Okay. I need a motion to approve D. One and two. First, just two. number two. D two. So moved. Second. Discussion. All in favor? Aye. Opposed? Abstentions. I now need a motion for E one. Yeah. E one through three. Just, just I just want to read in a quick correction on the over. On the trip that's on the end of that number three, the group attending the deck of students, the number of substitutes needed is one, not two. This, this is one. Okay. The number of so just make the correction. Okay. Two. One, two. Do we have a motion for that? So moved. Second. Discussion? All in favor? Aye. Opposed? Abstentions. I'm abstaining on number one. Mm -hmm. Under finance, I need a motion to approve F one and two. So moved. Second. 
Discussion? All in favor? I'll just discuss. I just want to talk, point out that the pointers that we're approving on this uh, agenda, they are other districts joining our existing routes, and it's nice because it's actually generating some more revenue for the district. It's making those routes cheaper for us, you know, that we're expanding, that we're able to pick up some other students and reduce our costs. So I just want to. Um, point that out. Farmer Vine, our transportation coordinator, has done an excellent job of working with districts around us to uh, try to you know, lessen our costs and lessen their costs. And this is an example. But how does that work? Like, they're picking up students to take them to school? Yes, but only if it works on the route that we already have. You know, so if it's, if it's um, you know, we'll join another district. So it's for out of district, out of district. Oh, out of district. Okay. Yeah. Right. okay. Thank so you. for like mass. Okay. I understand now. No, I thought they were coming to Mountain Park. Or, special, or special education at a district. Right, not our school. Oh, not our school. Hi, Tech, LA Health. I, 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 I want to reiterate that you know, I, I serve um, on Bayshore, Georgia, and OAC Board of Education. And OAC, we do, um, I showed you $44 million in transportation. Um, so that's something we're talking about all the time. This year, we're saving for 48. I, I really want to uh, I concur with what Ms. Scalper said that, you know, Barbara Bonnie, the work of the Transportation Office, through the collaboration of uh, Mrs. Doherty, not Mrs. Scalper, um, uh, is really, it, it really, we do as much of that jointure work on our own as we can because if we can still fill those seats on the bus, then otherwise we'd be open with other students and charge a, a per seat uh, cost charge as, as Ms. Mrs. Uh, Darcy said, it drives down our costs. So it's, it's really important and it is a saver and Barbara Bonnie does an outstanding job with that. Okay, all in favor? Aye. Opposed? Abstentions. I need a motion to approve G1. So moved. Second. Discussion? All in favor? Aye. Opposed? Abstentions. So I think we have the personnel. I. Uh, that is one through. One through eight. And then the. Is there one item? One through fifteen. The, the on the plus plus, plus, okay. So one through fifteen. So moved. Sorry. Discussion? All in favor? Aye. Opposed? Abstentions. All right, and that brings us to old business. Board members have old business, but uh, this says Arts Academy here under old business. There was this some discussion last month about Arts Academy, so that normally what we do is just oh, to revisit oh. the and numbers. It, it, we ended up by the end providing the numbers. Uh, there were right. questions about how many students from South were attending, and if anybody had dropped out. And by the end of the meeting, we had those numbers, so I think we're good. Okay. Your business? Okay. I, I have some things. Oh, yeah, I do too. You got First of all, I want to make a comment. The day we program tonight, I, I brought this up last year and I'm going to bring it up again. Can we please do these programs when there's not a board meeting or other things going on? Because we should all be attending it. So should the kids that were here encouraging those parents to go. And it's two different buildings. It's such a big issue, they think that everybody should be encouraged to go. We shouldn't be, I mean, we should be reviewing that presentation too. And, and it's always on the same No, it's not always, and we, we, we no, try to, lot. but Nikki Francis is very much in demand. She has a grant now to do these, I think it's $250, that's all we have to pay. We got the date that we, it was the only date we could have. It wasn't like we had a wide choice. It was either take her this date or don't take her at all. So, I mean, we made that choice. We really wanted to have it here so we could have it at the same place, 
but all shore was already here. So we made it, so we made it at 6.30, so people could actually go to that and still come. We accommodated it as best as we could with the parameters, and all right? We do understand that. We do try to make it differently, but sometimes it's out of our control. And, and to give additional understanding, to, to give additional understanding, you know, I just, I, to be clear, um, uh, the board last week, we had multiple meetings with committee. We're gonna have multiple meetings with committee again next week. We, we, we have 20 meetings on the book, just on board of education meetings. Um, and there is something going on in our schools every single night of the week. Really big so, I, I mean, it's so important, just, Dr. George. And we've had this discussion before, and you agreed 100%. Things, programs like this is so, so important for everybody to be able to get to. And, you know, and we agree, and that's why we try not to, to do say that. It's but not a it was huge either difference. have it tonight or not have it at all. So we thought that was more important. There were other vaping presentations in the past as well that were not on the same nights as board meetings. Yes. They were at they were earlier times. I, I've been to every one there was. So we're down the Yeah, so, I, so. I went there too. But we, you know, we tend to have drug and alcohol meetings and things that we really want our parents to get to, but there's a board meeting or there's, we're recognizing students or, which is all good things, but, you know, we gotta try to be able to make it that people, if we really want people to take it seriously, I mean, to say that there's not a vaping issue in our schools, that's no, no, not nobody true. I, I, I got, got three we need uh, vaping uh, calls. Right? We need to try to get parents there and we need my phone. to be there. Yeah. 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 We have to support it. Yes. We got Nikki Francis there and we can't even go and support it. You, know, you have to pick and choose. That's all I'm saying is we got you know, to try to get these meetings where people can attend. Absolutely. And maybe yes. 6.30 is too early, too, for parents that are coming home from work. Well, we had it at 6.30 to accommodate the board meeting. Well, because that, that way it was over by 7.30 and people could make it here by 8 o'clock. Does anybody go? I don't know, but we, we made it so that people who wanted to go could go. I mean, we, we accommodated sure it the best we should. Sure we went. There were three robocalls. Yeah, I, I got three robocalls. Yeah. And then the other thing is, um, before and after care. Can we get a survey from parents with concerns before we have that meeting? You know, I mean, there's gonna be parent representation, but again, like we've explained at the calendar committee, you should be going out and talking to yeah, these parents and we should be hearing from everybody, not just one or two people. Yeah. You know, because each school yeah. has different concerns and some have none. That's, that's what we've been trying to do with everything. You know, we did that with the calendar. We talked about the calendar earlier. We had over 2,000 responses from the school community. Can we see the from the, for aftercare? Um, because if we're going to be voting we'll, on it? We'll uh, absolutely work on that with the, uh, you know, to put together a survey. Yep. I'm just saying, and I want to know share the survey with the board. Yeah, no, I think the survey for the calendar was a huge success. So yeah. I think why not do it for before and after care? I think it's a great idea. Yeah. Yeah, that, that was the plan. Yeah. I'd like to see some of the comments from the okay. parents. Okay. Mm -hmm. And on top of that, I also would like to know if we've done a survey for the food service because I'd like to see the surveys on that. I don't know off the top of my head when the last survey they did was. I know they do normally survey throughout the year, so I can check and see what their plan is for this year. Yeah. I, I'm here I'll be on all the business for the next week. Yeah, I'm hearing a few buzzes, but nothing major, but I still would like to see the feedback because we never want to get to a position where we were the last time. Yeah, no, they but do, so I'll, I'll yeah, check with them. I think they're doing a good job, so. but yeah. I still would like to, to know myself what people are saying. Yeah. Great. Absolutely. Can I just point something out? This invitation you got, if somebody can look into it, it says that I was putting it into the calendar. May 29th is not a Wednesday. It's a Friday, so I don't know, okay. is it Friday or is it Wednesday? If somebody can look into this. Where's that from? Oh, you're right, this it is, is a Friday. This is from High School North, it's the poetry, the Grand oh, Slam of poetry. Today, so I thought that Jenny, you know, I don't know where they came from. I understand, but some, uh, is it Friday night or is it Wednesday night? If it's Wednesday, it's the Board of Ed. Mm -hmm. We'll check with Dr. Cartier. Whatever, just so you know, it's not, something's not right. <laughs> Thank you. So one of my adopted schools, Ocean Avenue, is having a gift auction. I promised them I would announce this uh, Friday, February 21st at 6 p.m. 
um, and you could still get your table. And uh, you contact Lisa Cordova, O-A-S-P-T-A at yahoo.com. Oh, okay, so under new business, um, I had the opportunity to attend the open house for No Limits Cafe, and it was an amazing event. It is so beautiful inside, and I also had an, the opportunity to talk to a lot of the people who will be working there. So I just urge all of you, and for the people watching on video, I'm not sure when it's opening, the exact date, but it's on social media. Um, it says opening soon. Please go there. I can't wait to go there and try it out. And I believe they also said that they would consider renting the space too. So if you have like some kind of party or a big dinner, um, that they would consider renting the space. It is so beautiful inside. And I just love everything about the place. So. That's great. Give it, yeah, give it a try. Again. Yep. Give it a shot, everybody. <laughs> I just want to add to that because I volunteer there, and they've been having soft openings this week. Okay. And um, the food is incredible. They have a chef that's out of this world. The kids are doing such a great job. Um, it's really nice to see that they're working and taking on responsibilities. So um, for me, that's, that's just an honor to be able to volunteer and watch and help. But, um, and they are looking for volunteers. I saw that on social media. They have, too. but they have a sign-up genie. If you go onto their website, if you want to volunteer, um, you have to do the whole shift though because you, know, you can't switch out. Right. And they said you have to be 18 or older. I know kids are always older. looking for volunteer hours, but they're now, required 18, to be 18 or older. And um, you know the, the training's going great. I think they're going to have like another week or two of training, and then they'll advertise when they're going to open up. But um, incredible process and. I have to say the Cartiers have been involved in our special ed programs for years, and the determination that they have for all these kids is just, you can't even say enough about them. They've done an outstanding job, and I think that No Limits is probably gonna be um, a long waiting line to get in when they open up, because so many people in the community know exactly what it is. And the sponsors they have, you know, they, they just took off of it. So, um, it's, it's really a good place. So I can't wait for them to open up for everybody to be able to get there. Yeah. And I, I see them on our school trip list, so right. I'm, I'm sure that our school kids will be going there and they'll get to see opportunities that they can have when they get older, you know, when they reach that 18. So um, it's just nice to see something in town where our students can get a job. Yep. Yeah. It's all positive. Also, um, I was school Fairview uh, school had a uh, giving back week um, where they had various different charities, um, um, the different grades did different things. It was pretty interesting. Plus, back to the age of the fifth graders, there was the um, Dennis Zelensky Memorial Fund, came from one of the grades, the Boys and Girls Club, um, also the Backpack Crew. So each of the grades had different experience and learned different things. I thought that was pretty pretty exciting. Um, I think it's the first time Fairview had done that in a while. It's a tremendous thing. Um, also, too, um, another question from um, some parents. Are we still doing the uh, recognition of, of business partners or um, yes, the school yes, district? Yes, we're well, still doing that, right? Yeah, there's, yeah. A couple, well, there's a couple of or people, I should have folks have asked. There's a couple of yeah. organizations that um, you know, PTAs and parents like to um, give a shout out to. We, we can also reach out to our principals at our next admin council meeting, too, to see, um, you know, you may disperse some interest in that too, but of course board members have. Um, yeah, I just want to know we do it. Please bring it forward to us. We usually do it every year. I we think like we left, where we left off with it is that the principal, the PTA were the principals, and they would approve it because there were some problems with main okay. groups just coming yeah. in for publicity and not and um, the following the. Um, so we'll put that on the agenda for our next board. meeting, council too. Thank you. Sure. Thank you. Anybody else? Okay, I'd like to open the mic to public comments. Just a quick question with the working um, meetings being eliminated. 
Is there any discussion of a commitment of when the agenda will be released? Um, so, I mean, the working meeting kind of gave everybody a week to react to what was going to be on the agenda. Is there a discussion about trying to get the agendas out at least a week early so the community still has the same amount of time? We did commit at one time to putting it out a, a couple days earlier than we usually do. I, I think that's been happening. Yeah, they were originally three. We've been doing five. Um, so we try to do it, uh, post them on the Friday before the next week, Wednesday board meeting. So to give uh, this, you know, as much time as possible. Uh, OK, I, I don't think it's been consistent. But that, if that's what you're looking at doing, so there be, OK. Um, I, I, I do think that that has been scheduled for the thing on Fridays. Has been? OK. Um, also, on, on looking at, at monetizing, um, now that I've somehow entered the world of competitive cheer with my youngest, um, I, I have to tell you, uh, I'm amazed at the amount of people and the amount of money going into some of these different schools. Um, you know, entrance fees, 25 bucks for a couple hours, you know. Um, um, a lot of school buildings, I mean, where I'm driving all the way down to Sickleville, you know. Um, yeah, but, you know, um, and I'm seeing lots of gymnasiums with big sponsors on the side. Um, so I, I'm just would like to say there must be a lot of different ways to monetize or, or use our buildings for different activities. I mean, yeah, I mean, even people you can host your own competition. Yeah. Um, because my daughter's in marching band and we go to schools and they host there and, you know, we have to pay to get in and we buy the food and we, you know, they have the food running the whole nine yards. Yes, I'm we, sure. We run the state well, a lot of that, a lot of that though, the money goes to the competition company. Just yeah. for being a dancer for years and years, a dance teacher for years, and being involved in dance competitions. But, but I've been surprised how many gyms I've seen that are sponsored. Right. You know, whether it's a healthcare institution or things like that. Uh, I mean, even this mid-year review, how many businesses would like to get to 11, 15,000 people? Um, obviously, you have to be careful who you're you know, attaching to your, your documents. But, um, you know, I, I could see something like that easily paying for itself for a salary because people want that distribution. They don't want the hard copy. They want they want the electronic touches. So just, you know, starting to Who's think of different ways. Yeah. Um, also, just, just quickly on the PSAT and, and park and, and maybe this is a separate conversation, but. I know the 10th graders just got results a, a month or so ago. And and I I guess I'm trying to figure out what the purpose is. Is it to take it and then the parents sit down with the kids and say, OK, that was a practice. Now what do we do next? Because I, I've gone, I mean, I have the overachiever. I, you know, I have all different levels of learning. And I have, I have a, a, a child that he's come close but all through elementary and middle school never passed park language arts and never got extra help came close um, you know PSAT a whole bunch of uh, his friends have not done well and it's just like okay and then we just move on so is there what are we you and I know now we're doing the eighth graders and, and, and it sounds great but it costs money and we're in the budget I'm just trying to understand what is it just practice? Because I'm, I'm, I, I, I'm, I don't, I don't know what the data is used for. Mrs. Pekus, I, I, I believe, I, did I hear that we were using some of the data from the PSAT for placement into APs, or is that not for placement, no. but for no. guidance okay. um, to better inform parents and students in terms of um, what coursework may be most appropriate? Mm -hmm. for their current levels of um, performance. So that's eight, eighth grade. Right. That's I mean, that, 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 so that was an opportunity. A lot of kids took it for the first time in 10th grade. Mm -hmm. And I'm seeing a whole bunch of kids that didn't meet benchmark. And the parents are like, OK, does that mean now I should get 
private tutoring because they struck you. Do you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. It's kind of like they took the test, now what? And I don't know if the PSAT for 10th graders was that considered hard or, or I, I, you know, I just, I don't, I'm just trying to understand because so I've got to. We're going to let you finish your, your question and then we'll answer at the okay. end. Okay. Just keep it more organized. Um, and then also um, on scholarships, um, not that this will apply to me, but I, I, just to give it a thought, I see that there's a first reading in it and, and it has nothing to do with it. But it's always been the top 15% of class, if I've got that right, um, scholarships, um, which is what caused kind of a lot of uproar about the AP versus honors. And I guess I'd just like some thought. You could have a kid that maybe has a learning challenge that works their tail off but can't get in the first 15%, volunteers, is an amazing human being, but will not be interviewed for a big bunch of scholarships. I just want to say, uh, I've never really heard that statement before. It's top 15. Because I sponsor a scholarship, and no one told me it was about the top 15. Yeah, I think there's only one scholarship that that applies to. We have a variety of scholarships. Yeah, we have a variety of scholarships. There's one particular one. 15 doesn't apply at all. Well, it, it's a variety of scholarships, but as I understand, my daughter got in to interview for those scholarships because she was the top 15%. I mean, there might be some others. Right, there are a lot. Like, for example, yeah. there's actually David Letterman has a scholarship, and he'll only look at, at, at like, I know it's David Letterman, but he only wants C students. Like, that's his, you know, criteria. But um, for real, that's like an actual thing. But they're all different types of scholarships. There are scholarships for left-handed. No, I, I know. But when, the ones only when you go years. in and you interview at South, and I see you're one of the committee members or whatever, I was told you had to be in the top 15% of your class. Okay, so board members, can we get so, your questions first and then we'll answer? Yeah. yeah. So uh, if it isn't, it isn't, but that's what the kids understood last year. Um, so, and I know that's why a lot of people kind of got upset about the APs versus honors because they felt that that could buy ranking, which could get you into more scholarships. So, again, I, if I'm wrong, that's, I, I'd love to understand how it works, but that was what I was told. Thank you. Thank you. I, I, I wrote down that I wanted to say thank you to Vera for offering a solution to one of our problems. Uh, that, that, that was really helpful um, for thinking about solutions going into our strategic plan. Um, so that's all I have to say. Robin, do you want to finish what you were saying? Oh, no, no. Not, I didn't know you were referring to just the scholarships, you know, for here. I was just saying in general, oh, yeah. there are so many for all different areas. So um, I don't know who could answer the question about the 15%. I think Mr. Hell is going to take that. So in the my uh, experience at Hesel Sound, they, they, they do run a uh, class rank and it's top 50% that are inviting down for the interviews. Um, however, if individuals have their own sponsors, I mean, their own scholarships, like um, Mr. Thomas, they can nominate or they can recommend whoever they feel is appropriate for their uh, scholarship. So the initial uh, list of people that are invited into the scholarship interviews are the top 50% of the class. But if they if these single um, scholarships leave it up to the school, then it's only the top 15% that get into interviews for them, right? Correct. Because there's no nice. stipulation. So if anybody does have a scholarship, they should be looking into maybe you don't want just the top 15, you want to know who's everybody. Because I don't think a lot of people understand that, Correct. that have scholarships. I think they just think that everybody's you know entitled to an interview. And if that's not the case, then um, what you are saying is it's right. A lot of kids lose out. It's something that we're sitting here saying we, we want to discuss. Thank you. Okay. Do both schools be equal to that? My understanding yeah. both schools yeah. are yeah. Will yeah. both high schools be equal when you, whenever you come to a decision, when you discuss oh. it and you plan it out? Yes. Okay. As they are now, both schools are still are both using the same practice. Practice will be consistent. Okay. Does anyone else from the public want to speak? All right, seeing no one come to the mic, I need a motion to adjourn the meeting. So moved. Okay. Opposed. Absolutely. Yeah, but I'm cutting it right.
Did they cut it? 